Jesus gave his life so man could truly be made free by the spirit that his father gave to you and me. It is like no other gift that you could ever get. And I pray that we will not forget to honor the gift of God. Honor the gift of God. Starting in the last of the three chapters that cover the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, stop judging so that you won't be judged. This is one of Satan's favorite scriptures. He knows a lot of them, quoted them to Jesus in the temptation. He knows them better than, or is more familiar with them than many of God's own children. And if you trust in your head knowledge of scriptures instead of the Spirit of God talking to you, he can trip you up. And that's what happens many times with this verse. With this verse, Christians have often intimidated God's children to stop listening to the Spirit because the Spirit is always guiding us toward righteous judgment. Toward judging. Every day, in every circumstance, all the time, the Spirit is creating inside of you. Through The Spirit does that to every person that has it. Whether they listen or not is up to them. But in every situation, all day long, is leading us giving us the equipment we need on the inside to make a righteous judgment. To judge rightly. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.15, a spiritual person judges everything. A spiritual person, that's somebody that's walking in the Spirit of God, judges everything. Now the rest of that verse says, but he himself is judged by nobody because the people in this world cannot judge you. But I didn't want to emphasize that. I wanted you to look at this. A spiritual person judges everything. And according to Paul, if we will do that among ourselves as a body, we'll escape the judgment of God. In 1 Corinthians 11, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So we have to have judgment among ourselves to escape the judgment of God. But Jesus said, stop judging. And some carnally minded people quote that scripture and say, we must never judge. And Jesus actually did say, stop judging. That's a quote from our Lord. But no one verse, no entire Bible of verses can contain all the truth about anything. You know, when say, when, when uh, I mean, the Bible speaks of a lot of situations, covers a lot of situations, but you multiply those situations covered in the Bible by about one million, yeah. and you kind of get close to your life. Yeah. <laughs> Because you face situations all the time not specifically covered in the Bible. That's, right. That's why we needed the Holy Ghost. Yeah. It'll go with us everywhere, and it knows everything, and it gives you the wisdom, the knowledge of God. John said, you have an anointing. That's the Holy Ghost. You have an anointing, and you know all things. Well, what he meant was you know everything you need to know because the Holy Ghost will let you know it. Amen. And you'll judge everything yeah. rightly. To stay in the will of God, we have to have more than the Bible. That's right. 
That's why Paul said the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Because only in the Spirit can we stay where we're judging rightly how we're doing and what we should do. We don't know without the Holy Ghost. All we have are the Scriptures that will kill us if we try to live by them. They don't cover everything. And that's what Jesus came to earth to do. To suffer and die to purchase the life of God right out of His own bosom that He would speak it into us. That's the sound that came from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. God saying, okay. Praise God. When, when Satan did quote Scripture to Jesus, he thought he had Him. When he said, you know the Scripture in, in the, what Psalm is it? Psalm 91. You know that Scripture applies to you that if you even trip over a stone, God will give His angels a commandment to help you. Go ahead and throw yourself off this building and prove to Israel that you are their Messiah. Go ahead. This is your opportunity. He quoted the Scripture. He shall give His angels charge over thee lest you st strike your foot against the stone. Satan was right. God did do that. What was Jesus going to do? He was in a box. <laughs> you don't box in the Holy Ghost that Jesus lived by. And He said, it is also written so that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the spirits out there who tell you Jesus said stop judging. Yeah. We're going to say it is also written. <laughs> because Jesus also said in John 7 do not judge by appearances but judge righteous judgment. Now Judge righteous judgment in John 7 is just as much a commandment as stop judging is in, in Matthew 7. So which one are you going to obey? Why not obey both of them? In Matthew 7, when he says stop judging, he was commanding his disciples to stop making up their own mind what's right and wrong. Judging by appearances. And that's what he said in John 7. Do not judge that way. But judge righteous judgment. He was commanding them in Matthew 7 not to judge according to what their senses told them. By appearances. By what you hear. What you see. Jesus wasn't judging that way. If, if he'd been judging that way, he'd have, he'd have failed. And he knew it. He said, I live by my Father. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever he tells me, I believe and I say and I do. He lived in the Spirit. This is a spiritual world. It can only be judged rightly by God. Yes. The Father of spirits and before whose eyes all things are open and naked, He knows everything. Yeah. Everything that's right. And Jesus in John 7 was following His example and He was commanding His disciples to follow His example. Yes. Yeah. When He said, don't judge by appearances, He meant the way I don't judge by appearances. Yeah, but judge righteous judgment the way I judge righteous judgment, which is by the Spirit of my Father. Amen. And in Isaiah 11, Isaiah prophesied Jesus would judge that way. I love these scriptures. He said a shoot, that's a little limb, sprout off a stump, that's Jesus. A shoot will come forth from the stump of Jesse. Mm. And a branch... That's Jesus. From His roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him. Jesus. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of God. And God shall make Him discerning in the fear of the Lord. He, Look at this now. 
He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor will he make decisions by what his ears hear. But instead of going by his senses, he in righteousness will he judge. Amen. Now, you've, we've already seen in, in the Sermon on the Mount a lot of commandments that the disciples couldn't keep. We've talked about that a lot. Well, Jesus, the disciples couldn't keep either one of those commandments Jesus gave. They could not stop judging by their senses because that's all they had. Yeah. They didn't have the Holy Ghost. He was giving them another commandment they couldn't keep. And when over in John, he said, don't judge that way, which they did every day of their life and couldn't get out of it, but judge righteous judgment, they couldn't obey that either. They were stuck. They were stuck. Because in order to judge righteous judgment, you've got to have God's righteousness. And they didn't have it because the Holy Ghost didn't, hadn't come yet to bring them the power with it. You've got to have power to judge righteous judgment. And in Romans 1, Paul said, the gospel of Christ is, is the power of God. In it, in the power of God, the righteousness of God is revealed and the disciples did not have that power until it came to them on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said in Acts 1, just a few days before it happened, He said, you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Before they received the Spirit, they had no power to stop judging and they had no power to judge. They couldn't do right. They couldn't do wrong. They, they were lost. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the coming of the Spirit was their only hope of obeying anything Jesus commanded. It's like, my, like I told you, my father said many times, Jesus didn't command His disciples to do a thing that they could do. <laughs> Glory to God. But He knew He was going to provide them with the power to do it. So He went ahead and commanded them. <laughs> Praise God. The, the Spirit was their only hope of obeying Jesus and it's yours. Yes. It's ours. Yes. It's everybody's only hope. Without the Spirit, Paul said, you're none of His. You can't obey God. You're stuck with the carnal mind. And the carnal mind cannot obey God. It's not subject to the law of God. And it can't be subject to the law of God. But the Holy Ghost comes to give you a different mind. And Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. That's what the Holy Ghost comes for. We have the mind of Christ so you won't be nailed down by some fool quoting Scripture. Thank you, Jesus. The body of Christ needs righteous judgment. It needs elders and pastors that can judge rightly. That don't judge by what they see and what they hear, but judge by that voice on the inside that whispers, this is the way. Walk in it. Mm, I, I don't know what say. It's a disgraceful thing for somebody with the Holy Ghost to still be judging things by appearances. Paul called it disgraceful. Look at what this in 1 Corinthians 6 when the Corinthians had no righteous judgment among them. He said, I say this to your shame. Is it really so that there is not a single wise man among you who is able to judge yes. between his brothers? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Listen, the matters that go on between us cannot be judged by this world. They can't be. In Corinth, they had two brothers. They went to law against each other. Paul said, what in the world are you doing? Going to the unjust to get a right answer. Yeah. Mm. Oh, God. Mm. 
My father said he used to see the sign justice of the peace and he wouldn't even say it that way. He'd say the injustice of the peace. <laughs> injustice with no peace. Yeah. The world doesn't have it. That's why the world can't take it away. Glory to God. When, when we don't have righteous judgment among ourselves, bad things happen. <laughs> Good things are discouraged. Bad things are encouraged. That's right. That's right. My mother ta told me, she said, things that controversies and issues among God's people need to stay among God's people. Yes. That's what David meant when the Holy Ghost spoke through him and said, Jehovah judges among the gods. Yeah. Who do you think he's talking about? The idols of Baal and idols? Oh, no. no, he's talking about you. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus said, those to whom the Word of God came. Didn't God call them gods? Yes. When the Word of God comes to you, and you, you are recreated by the power of God, you become sons of God. God becomes your la the last name of your family. Billy of God, Aaron of God, Leanne of God, Katie of God. God is your family name. You're gods. Uh, all my family, when I, when I had kids, Barbara and I had kids, they were all Clarks. Yes. Well, we are all gods. Yes. Because his, that's the family name. Yes. And the Lord is the only one that can judge among the gods. Right. How many hundreds of times have issues come up among us and I've listened to them, and I've listened to them. Everybody's right. Yeah. But God's got a bigger judgment. He weighs the spirits. Not the arguments, not the talks, not the explanations. He balances the spirits. That's how issues among us must be addressed or bad things are going to happen. Paul was really disappointed with the Corinthians because there was someone there in their midst living a desperately wicked life and there had been no righteous judgment. That's why he wrote this in 1 Corinthians 5. Very famous issue here. An immorality among you is widely reported. You're getting, you're getting, you guys are getting a reputation even among sinners. Widely reported and such an immorality that is not even mentioned among Gentiles in that a man has his father's wife. He had married his stepmother after they separated, I, I suppose. And yet, you are puffed up and have not mourned instead so that the one who has done this deed might be put out from your midst. As for me, absent in body but present in spirit, I cannot judge because Jesus said, do not judge. I have already judged. It didn't take him long to know what to do in that case. I'll make him of quick understanding, he said. I have already judged as if I were right there. I've already judged who? The one who has done such a thing. I already know what's right. I didn't pray about it 16 hours. I know. The Holy Ghost knows. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's with power, when you and my spirit are gathered together, and I'll be right there, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, turn such a man over to Satan. Cast him out of the body for the destruction of the flesh so that the Spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Maybe He will repent. Yeah, maybe he will. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? That's righteous judgment. Yeah, amen. Note that in verse 2, Paul judges the Corinthians themselves. The whole assembly. He judges them righteously because he said the reason they had failed to execute righteous judgment in this case is because they were proud. They become proud. And being proud, they had not grieved for sin. 
that was among them. I prayed about that in Lexington many years ago. I said, how, how did Paul connect pride with that? Where's, how does that make sense? Well, of course, it made sense in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And God helped me understand it that day. They were proud, and instead of mourning and, and praying, God, deliver us. Deliver him. He won't be delivered. Deliver us from him. Help. Instead of that, they were glorying. Look at the last verse. Instead of that, your glorying is not good. Now, that glorying is continuing to worship and praise God and, be, and speak in tongues, maybe even prophesy. They were doing that. Exercising gifts of the Spirit with that wickedness right there in the middle as if everything was fine. That's glorying. And the Apostle James said, don't do that. Look at James 3, 14. If you have bitter envy and strife in your heart or any other evil thing, I'll add that in there. Do not glory in spite of it. And so lie against the truth. God wants us to be real when we come before Him. Right. Really good. Yeah. Not just real, but really in the Spirit. Really spiritually minded. Really full of righteous judgment and peace and joy. But of what were the Corinthians proud? Maybe I'm influenced by the spirit of our times, but here's some ideas. Maybe they were proud of how patient and loving they were, yeah. as opposed to God. Now, you know God's patience and love are supreme. And the only way you can be more patient and more loving with God is to be patient and loving with more stuff. You can be superior to Him if you're patient and loving with things that God hates and will not tolerate. But when we do that, we open a door for demons into yes, our lives. Yes, 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 and it sounds to me as if a few of them were at operation or operating here in, among the Corinthians. Right. Or maybe they were proud, as the saying goes now, of being of how inclusive they were. Now, who can be more inclusive than God who said, Whosoever will? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the waters of life freely, but God won't turn the faucet on until you repent. That's right. That's right. The, only, his, mm, the only way you can be more inclusive than, than God is to turn the faucet of fellowship on without repentance from the sinner. Mm. That makes you more inclusive than God. But when you do that, you open a door for more demons to come into your life. And the influence of them. And the thoughts of them that will leave you in complete confusion. As you see in this culture, everything's included. Everything's okay except the truth. And look at the demons that are being turned loose on this society. Maybe they were proud of knowing how great God is and how He alone knows the heart. Maybe that was it. And therefore, since he alone knows the hearts, and we don't, we can't judge. Mm -hmm. So we have to include all things. Boy, I tell you what. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Hey. God knows the hearts. Yes. But he sent his son to suffer and die, to come back up to him and ask him to let us know the hearts. Yes. Give us the power to discern and to feel what the Heavenly Father feels and know what the Heavenly Father knows about everything. The spiritual judge everything because God does and they follow Him. In the book of Acts, look at this. The Spirit revealed to Peter what was in Simon sorcerer's heart. In Acts 8, he said, you have no part or portion in this matter. Now that matters. <laughs> Look at him judging somebody's heart. Yes. Your heart is not right with God. Right. Glory to God. 
Peter, Jesus said, don't judge. He said, I'm not. That's what I heard from the Spirit. Ooh, yes. Oh, I know I feel that in my bones. This guy is not right with God. I perceive, I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and the fetters of unrighteousness. What Peter perceived, he perceived by the Spirit. That he felt all through him. This guy's heart is not right with God. You see, the Holy Ghost doesn't come to teach you math. No. Your brain can figure that out. Yeah. Or geography, or science, or anything else of the flesh. The Holy Ghost comes to reveal to you that you might know the unknowable. Yeah. Mm. Peter had no way of knowing how that, what that man's heart was like. No way. It was impossible. Judging by how what he saw, what he heard, all his flesh... He had no way of knowing what was on the inside, but he knew what was on the inside because Peter was being led by the Spirit of God that Jesus suffered and died for. For, Peter, for people to glorify God for, by how much he, by, for how much he knows, knowing all the hearts and to sit back in their darkness and their rebellion against Christ and say, well, we can't judge because we don't know is just another way of saying, don't you dare give us the Holy Ghost. We won't have it. We're too proud of how ignorant we are. But God, you are mighty. That's like carnally minded people who will sit here in their sin and say, oh, Jesus, the light of the world. That is stubbornness and rebellion. Jesus is not the light of the world, and He said so. He said, I am the light of the world as long as I am in the world. Now you are the lights of the world. And rather than be the lights of the world, be full of the Holy Ghost and act and think and judge like it, we just keep pointing to Jesus. It must make God sick. My, my. my, my. <laughs> the Spirit of God is available. Yes. God's righteousness is available. Yes. The knowledge of God is available. Yes. And it's rebellion and there's no excuse not to have it. No. Right. No. Learn what you got. Yes. Open up your present. Yes. Feel the feelings yes. of the Spirit that's inside of you. Yes. Dare to let Him think in you. It's a shame not to do those things if you have the Spirit of God. Paul said disgraceful. Disgraceful for us to act like those without the Spirit and believe the doctrines of those without the Spirit who will tell you, do not judge. In other words, don't you dare let that Holy Ghost in you tell you what I am. Because mm. uh, I ain't. I am not what the Spirit says I am. That's all they're saying. They don't want you to go by your feelings because they don't want you to pay attention to how bad you feel when they teach their doctrine. You judge righteous judgment, you feel sick and get out of there. We have a commandment from Jesus to follow His example who followed the Father in everything He judged. We have, an exa we have a commandment yes. to judge the way He judged. That's a commandment. Yes. Mm. So forget about Jesus saying don't judge. It's covered by the commandment that said to judge, righteous judgment. You do that and the rest will take care of itself. Yes. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. You know, when Jesus told them stop judging, they couldn't do it. If you're alive, and this applies to every human being, from the time an infant can start thinking to the time you go to a grave. If you are alive, you're judging. Yeah. Every day you're judging. 
You can't avoid it. You make judgments every day. And it may sound silly, but I'm talking about judging whether to go outside without a coat or not. Yes. You make all kinds of judgments, big ones, little ones. You're making them. The only issue is, are you judging the way Jesus said not to, or are you judging the way Jesus said to go? Right. Now, you have a judgment. You make judgments when you're at, a, at the beach or at a lake or at a river not to go out walking on the water because your common sense tells you not to do that. Jesus didn't go by that. <laughs> and they thought they saw a ghost coming out. <laughs> they thought Jesus was a ghost several times. They thought he was a ghost after he raised from the, was raised from the dead and appeared in the room. They thought they saw a ghost and they screamed. And Jesus said, this is not a ghost. A ghost does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. <laughs> I have never been a ghost, but I've got one. <laughs> and I live by that one. To pretend, as some people do, that they never judge is to make yourself look like a fool. Because you are being foolish. You are judging. You're judging me right now. Now, on what basis are you judging me? Let me give you another example of an impossible commandment of Jesus in John 13. Last Supper, Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another the way I have loved you. So also you must love one another. Now they couldn't keep that commandment. They couldn't possibly love one another the way Jesus said love them because... They hadn't received the spirit that he had. And in Romans 5, Paul said, the love of God is poured out within our hearts by reading the Bible. Uh, when, uh, <laughs> by, mm, I know my, by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. God gave you the spirit to be like Jesus. Amen. He has opened a door for you to be like Jesus. Amen. You can do it. You used to not be able to do it, but now you can be like Jesus. You can love people the way he loved them. You can judge people the way he judged them. That's what it's all about. You know, Moses was like Jesus in this respect. Well, he told Israel in Deuteronomy 18, a prophet like me, that's Jesus, Will the Lord your God raise up for you from among you, from your kinsmen, to him you must listen. And then he gave them commandments they couldn't obey. They couldn't listen to Moses and do what he said many times because the commandments weren't for the wilderness, they were for the land of Canaan. Like this one in Deuteronomy 12. You have not yet has come to the rest and to the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. But when you have crossed over the Jordan and have settled in the land which the Lord your God will cause you to inherit, and when he has given you rest from all your enemies round about and you dwell in safety, in other words, you have time to think about it, this is what you must do, then there will be a place which the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name. There shall you bring all that I have commanded you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and offerings of your hand, and all the best of your votive offerings which you may vow to the Lord. Now Israel could not make those sacrifices, bring their tithes and offerings, and etc., worship God in that one place in the wilderness because it wasn't in the wilderness. No. It was in the land of Canaan. Amen. And Moses gave them a number of other commandments that were for the land of Canaan only. Well, Jesus did that. They could not worship God in the one place he had chosen. Just as Israel couldn't worship in the one place God had already chosen for them to worship in, Jerusalem. The disciples couldn't worship God in the one place they had to worship God, which was in spirit and in truth. Because, well, 
when they received the Spirit, they could. And when Israel went into the land, they could. And this has been a repeated theme throughout this Sermon on the Mount. The sermon, as I've said several times now, is just a description of Jesus' life in the Spirit, how he was, how he was living, what he was feeling from the Spirit, what he was thinking in the Spirit, and he gave them, he described it as commandments to us and his disciples. And another repeated lesson connected with this judging in this case is verse 2, reaping what you sow. You know, verse, verse 1 said, stop judging so that you will not be judged Stop judging in the flesh so that you won't be judged in the flesh according to how you look and according to how you sound. In verse 2, he tells them, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And by what measure you measure, that is, toward others, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the splinter that is in your brother's eye but don't consider the log in your own eye. That's judging according to the flesh, unrighteous judgment. Or how will you tell your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, yeah, let me conduct this delicate surgery on your eye, and behold, a log is in your own eye. Hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye first. God has to do that. Yes. And then you'll see clearly how to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Remind, that's righteous judgment. It reminds me of what Jesus said to Peter during the Last Supper. When Peter was claiming he would stick to Jesus to death, and he was saying, no, you're going to deny me three times. And, no, I'll never deny you. And he said, Peter, you know, I prayed for you, son, that when you deny me, your faith won't fail. I pray for you that you'll hang on by, by your fingernails, but you'll hang on. And when you are converted, strengthen the brothers. Peter couldn't strengthen a fly before the Holy Ghost came. He ran like the rest of them. He cursed and denied he didn't even know Jesus. That's us without the power of God recreating, re reconfiguring our circuits to think rightly. We all want to be judged mercifully. Well, Jesus is saying that's available, but in order to get it, you have to judge mercifully. You have to judge the way God does. Then you'll be judged that way. So there's a lot riding on how you judge things. Jesus was 100% right when he said stop judging by appearances. And he was 100% right when he said judge righteous judgment by the Holy Ghost. Mm. Then he adds an important lesson to them in verse 6. Don't give what is holy to dogs and don't cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them with their feet. They want to steam on them being pearls. Pigs don't know the difference between pearls and any other slop. They'll just eat it all, trample all of it. And then they'll turn and tear you to pieces. When we make the mistake of casting our pearl before swine, we're actually doing what Uncle Joe used to say, getting to people before God does. When you cast your pearl before swine, you feel... The spirit is grieved. And it's not a bad feeling. It's kind of like my father said one time, Jesus told his disciples, if, they, if you go preaching to a city and they don't receive you, just kick off the dust up and walk away. Let, if they don't receive your greeting of peace, then let your peace come back on you. He, said, he told me, he said, when that happens, because it had happened to him a number of times, I'm sure, when he was not received and that peace that he was offering came back on him, he said, that's not a good feeling a bad feeling. You would think peace coming back to you. Oh, that'd be all right. No, it's a it's, it's very bad feeling. And it's a very, very bad feeling to have swine trample a pearl 
and then tear, tear at you. I've made that mistake once. I, I remember uh, years ago, uh, let me see, it have to be, have to be before 1980 when I published the uh, Spiritual Light book. Because one of the chapters in there, Jesus had shown me. This was in 1976 when Jesus had shown me this about the sacrifice of Christ. Four years in a row, I was telling this the other day to people. Four years in a row, beginning the summer of 1975, then in 76. In 75, he, showed, he revealed to me, first time Jesus had ever himself taught me, what taking the name of the Lord is. 76 is the sacrifice of Christ. And then the next one year apart, and those four things are the spiritual light book. Well, I was excited about it. I liked it. <laughs> I appreciated it. And I was telling a relative of mine about the sacrifice of Christ. One, that was a precious pearl to me. And telling him about it, and he wasn't, he wasn't interested at all. And I thought in my brilliant self that if I just told him Jesus revealed it to me, that would at least make him a little calmer so he, he could I could get the point across to him. And so I humbly and sincerely <clears throat> just let him know in some words I can't remember, but Jesus revealed this to me. <clears throat> or Jesus showed this to me. And his answer was, well, Jesus showed this to me. And it just, uh, ugh, what a bad feeling. I wasn't angry at him. I didn't hate him. I wasn't, I wasn't even embarrassed. It was the Holy Ghost being grieved not with him, with me. I had cast my pearl before somebody who was spiritually swine. Yeah. And they died without the Holy Ghost and they died scoffing at it. I got to him before Jesus did. I had moved out ahead of the Spirit and cast his precious pearl that was Precious to me before a being, a creature that to him is the same as hog slop. Nothing. God is a great king. He had to tell us that. He says that in the prophets. Can you imagine our creator having to yell down at us through the prophets saying, I am great. Do you not get this? He told him in Isaiah, he said, I don't see any other gods up here. What are you talking about? We're pitiful. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. We're pitiful. The Holy Ghost is not pitiful. You get the Holy Ghost, you're never a victim again the rest of your life. You are more than a conqueror. My, 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 my. God is not a beggar. He chooses us. Mm. He doesn't just beg and beg and beg until he talks us into believing. Yeah. He chooses us, sows the seed within us, and waters it and lets us start feeling things we never felt before and thinking things we never felt before. Let me try to explain it like this. Because I've had this thought run through my mind in the past a number of times. When Jesus was raised from the dead, the high priest and the Pharisees and the elders of Israel, even the Romans, thought when Jesus died, they thought it was over. But when God raised him up from the dead, I have thought, why didn't he just send Jesus to them and say, see, I was really the Messiah. See, I'm it. See the scars and show him his scars so he'd prove he's the same one. Why didn't God do that? To help him out. See, the carnal mind thinks it's smarter than God. <laughs> that would have done it. But then I remembered this scripture in Acts 10. Because Peter tells Cornelius and his household that God selected who he would honor by seeing his son. Mm. Acts 10, 40, God raised him up on the third day and he permitted him to be seen, not by all the people who had rejected him, but by witnesses chosen before Jesus died by God. By us. I was one of them. Yeah. Amen. Glory. 
who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And then he commanded us to preach to the people and testify to them that Jesus is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. God chose who was granted the honor of seeing his son after he's not a beggar. If he'd have been a beggar, oh, come on, Pharisees, can you believe now? Seeing Jesus is an honor. If you ever see him, you're going to be greatly honored to lay eyes on Jesus. I love that song, Oh, I Want to See Him. God, make me worthy to see Him. He granted, he granted the honor of letting people see Him when He rose from the dead, and He'll honor us if He'll catch us up alive or dead to be with Him in the air and, and behold Him face to face. That will be an honor. That will be an honor. But more than that, God decides who to honor with believing in His Son. Look what Jesus said in John 6. No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him. God wasn't drawing the chief priests and the Pharisees. Is that You got Acts 10? God wasn't drawing the Pharisees and the high priest and the, and the Roman soldiers and the rest. He wasn't. That's who He sends His Son to, who He decides to draw to Him. No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws Him, and I will raise Him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by Professor Jones. Everybody in the kingdom of God will have been taught by God. Everybody then who hears and learns from the Father comes to church. Every human being on the planet who has heard and learned anything from God starts having feelings about Jesus. Because that's what, that's what God's thinking about. That's what God teaches. Mm. Mm. At some point in your life, you were drawn by God. At some point, you heard by some means from Him. And you learned something. You received what He was giving you. At some point in your life, that's how you get here. He touched your heart and made you curious what was true. That's making you curious about His Son because Jesus said, I'm the truth. Praise God. It was with you the way it was with Jesus' disciples when they asked Him, why won't you explain all this to everybody? He said, not given to them to you. It is given. If it is not given, you cannot have. But how is it given? Paul told us how God has chosen to give it. God to Paul told us how it is that every one of us came to believe and call on the name of Jesus for mercy. Romans 10. How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? That's the truth. You don't yeah. believe Him. You're not going to call Him. And how shall they believe in Him of whom they've not heard? You don't know anything about Him. You're not going to know whose name to call out. And how shall they hear without a preacher? I mean one sent from God. Yeah. And how shall they preach except he be sent by God? Yes. Notice back in Acts 10, the last verse that you just read. Back in Acts 10, verse 42. After God honored Peter and the rest to see his son, Peter said, he commanded us to preach to the Pharisees and to the chief priests and to the people. He wasn't going to let him see his son 
He, God has determined that you're going to believe the gospel to go to His Son. And you're going to believe it by hearing it. And you can't hear the gospel without somebody sent from God. That's just the way God chose to do it. He could have sent Jesus to Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate. And, you no, know, I'm going to let a few little men sin, and some of them I'm going to send you. You tell them. Woo. And Jesus said, if they don't believe them, they won't believe if even if somebody raised raised from the dead. That's how God has chosen this. Yes, it is. My, my. You might have joined a church as I did when I was young. And you might have been a good member, but you could never have believed in God's Son if He hadn't called you. If He hadn't drawn you somehow through some means from Him. And that invitation is what the Bible calls being called. Peter said on the day of Pentecost to every, the mockers and everybody else watching him, he said, this that you see in here is for you and for your children and to those that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's invite. His call is an invitation to come to his house. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Glory. Thank you, God. God's way happened. Yes, Jesus went away so that people, Pharisees, scribes, elders, the Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus, they couldn't see him anymore. They had to believe preaching. And when Peter and John were dragged before that same, the same judges, Sanhedrin, that cursed Jesus and stoned Stephen, Later, same ones, they preached Jesus. Amen. If you're asking us, he said, how that lame man got healed, let me tell you about the one you killed. Yeah. Oh, wow. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And this Holy Ghost that I've got, he said, <laughs> he gives to everybody who obeys him, which means you guys haven't done it. Woo. Then they got some sticks and beat them up real bad and said, don't ever preach in his name again. And they left there thank, thank God we were worthy to be beaten for preaching the gospel. Stephen tried it and they hauled him out and stoned him to death. But it was God's way. You believe that or be damned. He's not going to send Jesus to you. He's going to send His Word to you. And that comes through Jesus. And the Word of God is God. It's Jesus, the Son of God. If that finds no place in you, some demon plucked it up out of your heart. And God's not drawing you. Paul describes God's method that He has chosen to save people in 1 Corinthians 1. 118. The message of the cross is one of two things. Watch this. Every human being decides whether it's one or the other. It's either foolishness, and that's to those who are being destroyed on their way to damnation, but to us who are being saved, that message is the power of God. For when in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom did not know God, that's his wisdom, he decided the world by wisdom wouldn't know him. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Amen. I mean, you really think, think about singing. What is singing? What is it? You're sitting there and you're, why not just say what you got to say? <laughs> what is preaching? Right. I mean, without any spiritual fellowship, it'd be one guy up here yelling at a bunch of other people. <laughs> foolishness. But God has chosen foolishness to confound the wise. For the Jews demand a sign and the Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. But to us, 
to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, we are preaching Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. Amen. Mm. I want you to go by your feelings. I want you really to go by your feelings. How you feel about this. How is what I'm saying make you feel? I want you to live by that. Act on it. Go by it. Be moved by how you feel if you feel something. If you don't, don't fake it. Mm. At some point in your life, you felt an invitation. You didn't know where it was going or where you were going or where you were going to end up with, but you felt something. And you followed your feelings all the way to Jesus. And when you kneeled at His feet, His feelings filled you up. And you were invited into the household of God where He had a place prepared for you. A place He had prepared for you before He called you. He got everything ready, then He said, come in. And none of us knows why. I look at me and think, well, he chose the foolish to confound the wise, all right. None of us knows why he picked you out to be given an invitation. Sometimes he'll pick a husband out of a family or a child out of a family or a wife or just one. Jesus said, I've come to bring division. There'll be five in a household, two against three, three against two. I've come for that because my Father is only going to draw who He wants. And there's not a thing you can do about it. You can't do a thing about how you feel. You can't help feeling the Spirit. And they can't help not feeling. So don't hold it against them and pray that they're just stubborn sheep. They're not goats. And that they'll give in at some time. And sometimes... When I hear your wonderful testimonies, my, see your wonderful testimonies and see your faith and the things you go through and how you handle them. I don't even feel worthy to be among you as a servant of Christ. Nevertheless, as another man God chose a long time ago said, I am what I am. <laughs> By the grace of God. Amen. He chose if my seminary training had had its intended effect, it would have trained the call of God right out of me. One of the most miserable times I had in seminary is when I had to come up with a six-month lesson plan. Pre preaching plan. Six months. Now, how do I know what I'm going to be telling you in six months? I can know if I'm trained to have this, and no matter what's going on in your life, I can stick to it. And I'll be as dead and as useless to you as the Bible is without the Holy Ghost. So, as far as being pastor and teacher, to me, it has been given. That's right. That's how I got it. I had a high school friend wrote me one time and said, you have become what you said you would never be. Well, I never would have been. But God gave it to me. Now, Paul said a charge has been given to me. Woe be to me if I preach not the gospel. And to you, I have been given yes. as a helper to your faith. Yes. 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 Paul said it's required that student, that stewards of the mysteries of God be found faithful. And I hope that's how Jesus judges me. May God bless us and honor us with walking together on the streets of New Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Amen. Walking together, Billy, on the streets of New Jerusalem. Oh, oh, it's never entered into our hearts. 
but that you feel how good it's going to be. (laughs) Except by the Spirit. That's the only way we can know how good it is, what God has planned for us. God, God grant us that honor. And I'll finish with this as I've found myself saying more and more frequently as time goes on. I love you all. I can't help it. I don't get any credit for it. I'm just telling you about it. <laughs> Thank God for us. It's like I, I told a fool in my office back in 2006. He didn't like so many people being around. He just wanted to see me. I said, this is me. And if he'd have had the right spirit, it would have been him. Yes. And everybody would have been happy. It would have been yes. no problem. Been no problem whatsoever. No problem. We didn't want any problem. That's why I didn't turn you loose. That's why I did. That's why I grabbed on you and said, no, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> you mm. my, my, my. And that kind of gives me hope because I know I love you. And if you are me. I, I like myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way God's planned it. That's, how, that's His plan. That's His way. And God help us cooperate with it. Amen. seen God's people turn or walk away It is never easy, no, that is not Jesus' way They may give a reason, but that reason it is not They wouldn't rest and take the time to stop and honor the gift of God Honor the gift of God